The various things to think about with power are status, the way that characters, you know, their importance. So Mr. Burling, very important. Obviously Edna, not very important. Um, I'd also then be tempted to look at the power of the law versus the power of morality. I don't know if you can see that from where I've positioned the camera, but the power of law versus the power of morality. Um, I'd then be tempted to look at uh, power and responsibility, that line from Spider-Man, you know, where, was it great power comes with great responsibility or something along those lines, power and responsibility. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Because responsibility is a big theme in the play, you know, you've got this thing, you talk as if we were all responsible for each other, like bees in a big hive, those sorts of quotes, and I'd also have a section on the power of money. So let's start with status, and when I say status, I'm really talking about how important the characters are on stage, how other characters treat them. And there are some really you know, great bits of status you can look at, but some of the ones that are kind of the most clear and the most interesting is the way that the Mr. Burling changes in status with relation to the inspector. Um, at the start of the play, and how he changed in status the inspector at the end of the play. Um, at the very beginning of the play, the inspector comes in and it's Burling's house and Burling is pretty much the boss and he uses all sorts of kind of techniques to try and show the inspector that he's the one who's in charge. Let me just turn off my radio in case I get called. Um, that he's the one who's in charge. You know, he tells him that he's a keen golf player and that he knows his boss, Chief Colonel Constable Roberts or something like that. Chief Constable Colonel Roberts, that's right. And uh, Burling is the one showing all of the power. I beg your pardon? Now look here, inspector. I won't have this. And the inspector is the one who's a little bit more, he still has power, but it's not as obvious as it is later. At the end, Mr. Burling has much less power. He's pleading with the inspector, look, I give thousands, thousands. And the inspector, by this point, has got a lot more status. He's actually saying to Burling, don't stammer and yammer at me, man. You know, he's actually bossing him around. And on the one hand, you can make a point how that's just about status. Burling has got less status at the end, the inspector's got more. But remember that Burling symbolizes capitalism. And the inspector symbolises a kind of socialism. So we're saying that at the beginning of the play, Burling has more status because the capitalists are running the show. And at the beginning of the play, the inspector, as a socialist, has less status because they're all cranks, according to Mr. Burling. But at the end of the play, Burling has got less status because the inspector's proved him to be an arrogant, selfish and cruel person. And the inspector has even more, which allows him to boss around Burling. So it's not just interesting because it's dramatic that Burling goes from being the strongest to the weakest, or one of the strongest to the one of the weakest, but it also symbolises how capitalism has been defeated by socialism. Uh, one of the next things you can look at for status is Sheila. Sheila at the very beginning of the play has got this kind of, um, that she calls her mother mummy. You know, she gets the engagement ring off uh, Gerald and it's all, oh, look after it, be careful dear. You know, she doesn't have a great deal of status, but at the end of the play, at the end of the play, she's an independent woman. Independent woman. Um, she actually starts to argue back with her parents and use sarcastic comments like, oh, I suppose we're all nice people now. And she gets her own views and her own feelings and, and, and in a way that, um, that she doesn't have at the start. And yes, just like we said with, uh, with Mr. Burning and the Inspector, this symbolises bigger ideas. She at the start represents sort of the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century woman, very dependent on men, um, not thinking for themselves and not independent. But at the very end, she becomes this different woman, this, this very kind of strong woman that will, you know, would have been much more familiar to women uh, and men in the 40s who would have known that women had a much wider role in society because of the war. So she actually changes and evolves considerably. And that's not just about drama, go Sheila, go Sheila. It's actually about the didacticism, the ideas as well, because it shows that feminism is growing in stature, becoming more significant as the play goes on. So even just looking at Berlin, the Inspector and Sheila, there is absolutely loads that you can say about status. The other thing that I'd be tempted to look at is the power of law versus the power of responsibility. I hope you can see that. Um, see if that's better. Burling, um, Burling hasn't broken the law by Eva Smith. He's just done what supposedly any businessman should do. Um, Mrs. Burling hasn't broken the law by not helping um, Eva Smith either. They, 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 they've not broken any rules here. The thing is, is that it's just not right. The law somehow allows the rich to get away with things. So. That's one of the quotes I'd look at here, and I'd be tempted to look at sort of those quotes like, 
how Burling manages to control the situation by sort of saying things like, you know, oh, do you play golf to the inspector? As if, well, he's high status, therefore he can, because he knows the policeman, he, he can break the system. He's actually been a magistrate. Burling has got no kind of moral sense at all. He seems like an awful selfish person, has been a magistrate, which goes to show that if you've got the money in those days, you know, you could, you could buy into power, and it didn't matter if you were a moral person, but the law is just there to sell, serve the, the interests of the rich. You can look at other bits and pieces. So, for example, um, the way that he says to the inspector that it's my duty to cut costs and to make a profit, you know, it's his duty. In the same way that you'd expect duty is a moral duty, to do the right thing, Burling says, oh, that's not my role. Because if you think about it, you know, capitalism rewards those who are willing to make the sacrifices necessary to make money. And often those sacrifices involve cruelty or, or selfishness um, to your fellow man. She had far too much to save herself. Get rid of her. Morality. You could do a whole bit on that, really, in the way that um, all the way through, although he's not got the money of Mr. Burling, the inspector chips away at Mr. Burling by making these comments about his morality. You know, all these comments like, for example, it's better to ask for the earth than to take it. These are for moral messages. Because the inspector is sort of trying to get everybody to appeal to, to, appeal to their conscience. And he certainly manages to do that to Sheila and Eric. Sheila and Eric at the end who say, I mean, Sheila who says, I suppose we're all nice people now. She's realised that it's not about whether or not, you know, not, Burling's happy at the end for that brief moment before the inspector or the police come back. He's happy because even though he's done wrong, he knows that he can control it because he's in control of the law. So he, because it's not illegal, because he's not going to get arrested, he hasn't done anything wrong. Whereas at the end, Sheila knows that it doesn't matter if it's illegal, it's immoral. And so there's all sorts of quotations you'll be able to find you can pull out to do with law and morality. The power of money is quite a nice one as well. And um, looking at what money can actually do, I mean, it links a little bit to the power of law and the power of money here. Burling at the end of the play says, for example, I'd give thousands. Yes, thousands. You know, as if that makes a big difference, as if by paying money to the inspector suddenly can make it all go away. Look, inspector, I give thousands, yes, thousands, because all his life he's been able to buy off the police or he's been able to buy himself into the law. And that's one of the things that power lets you do. It lets you, so money lets you do it, lets you buy legal power. But there's other things that, that the power money lets Burling have. Like, for example, Burling, by having money, is allowed to kind of have social status. He's allowed to become a, 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 a you know, a a Lord Mayor, he's allowed to become a magistrate, all these things, because he has money. Not because he's a nice person, but because he has money. And not only that, he, you know, he uses money to translate into things like, you know, the port, which shows that he's a sophisticated person. He's not a sophisticated person. Mrs. Burling's always correcting his table manners, but he can buy the exact, the word is exactly the same kind of port that Gerald's father buys, because he thinks that if he can do that, he'll somehow be a better man. But actually, the irony is that you take away his money, and he's not a nice man. He's a selfish and arrogant man. So the money is a kind of lie. The power of money allows him to pretend to be something he's not. It's the same thing with Mrs. Burling. Mrs. Burling, one of the cruelest characters in the book, really cold, actually says in the stage directions, a cold woman. Yet because she runs a charity, you know, she's allowed to have this socially acceptable thing that, you know, she's helping the less fortunate. But really she isn't. She's just doing it to get more status. It's a sort of nice social thing that rich women do. Money allows her to have the mask of being a nice person when really she doesn't. And I think one of the best examples in the play is Alderman Megatee. You might have missed him, but it's that moment when um, Gerald talks about going to the Palace Bar to pick up uh, Eva Smith. And he talks about Alderman Megatee, or horrible old Joe Megatee, pinning a prostitute into the corner with his fat belly. You know, and the idea that um, Mrs. Burling says, surely you don't mean Alderman Megatee. An alderman in those days was a very senior official in the council. And she's astonished that because this chap is, is high up, we suspect because he's wealthy, but certainly because he's got the power of the law behind him, because he seems respectable, you know, we expect that he'll act in a respect. Because he's got, you know, that, that social title, we expect that he'll be a nice person. But he won't be. Because actually, Priestley's saying that it doesn't matter about social titles, status, money, you know, you know how, the influence you've got over the law. It's about morality, and it's about your real personality, not, not a personality that you buy. So I look for quotes that are to do with people buying things that are uh, personal qualities they don't really have. Um, like Sheila, you know, thinks she's a nice person because she's got nice dresses, but she doesn't. She's, um, she, when she realises how horribly she's behaved, she feels ugly. She feels unattractive to others. The last one, I don't know why I rubbed that out. The last one is power and responsibility. And I would really, when thinking about the responsibility that comes with power, I think about the responsibility people take for their actions. And I start to look at the old generation and the new generation. 
So, for example, um, the Burlings don't learn anything. They've got that brief moment in the play when they can sort of, then the inspector's gone, when they can potentially learn to change, but they don't. The inspector's there, smashes everything up, then we've got a moment of calm, and then at the end we get that call that smashes everything up again. They've been really arrogant up until then. And it's almost like World War I and World War II. I know it sounds a bit odd, but everything's calm in their peaceful little middle-class world, rose-tinted middle-class world, until the inspector arrives and smashes everything up. Then they've got a chance to learn, just like Britain and Europe had a chance to learn after the First World War. But they don't. And they repeat the same mistake. They fall into the same arrogant pattern they had at the start. Just like Europe falls into the same pattern and has another war, which people would have just gone through and will be feeling really bitter and unhappy about. So the older generation, you see, they don't learn. And there's two things you can look at that. One is by looking at their uh, refusal to take responsibility. But you can also look at how in Burling's speech, which is a really great, really great bit of writing, with all the dramatic irony. I've got a video on that you can watch if you want to revise it over the holidays. Burning speech um, just shows how um, they didn't, because they didn't, because they were so arrogant in their own beliefs, the capitalists and the wealthy kind of industrialists could have stopped a lot of the catastrophes that happened in the 20th century, but they didn't. So the responsibility that lies with those who are in power because they've got money or because they've got status or because they've got the law behind them didn't prevent them from being able to stop the war. Priestley's probably doing the harshest thing in the play here by almost suggesting that through their arrogance, the rich allowed the war to happen. This is contrasted with the new generation. Gerald is an older chap, he's in his 30s, older than Sheila and, and Eric anyway. But even so, his money's inherited, he comes with an old title. And as a result, he falls in easily with the Burlings. The new generation of Eric and Sheila are very quick to realise that they've done something wrong. And it's the one thing that the old generation don't. And it's as though through this kind of element of power and responsibility, Priestley is saying that if you can only realise when you've done wrong and take responsibility for it and try and think about how you can cause less harm to others, then there will be no conflict, there would be no war and there would be no social inequality that leads to the death of Eva Smith. So quotations to do with Sheila and Eric's change Quotations to do with Burling's lack of change and his arrogance at the start are going to be really useful there. So, to summarise, power in the inspector calls is exhibited through the status of the characters, not just dramatically on stage which character is more important or less important, but also the way that that status links to the ideas. By destroying the man, Priestley destroys the idea. Secondly, power is used to show that the law is not an effective force in ensuring that we all behave nicely to each other. That in fact the power of morality, the, the idea of what's right for everybody in society, taking responsibility, is in the end the kind of power that the inspector has. And although that's not legal power, it's okay because the, priest, because the inspector really isn't a normal inspector. He's almost like our conscience. He symbolises our conscience. And you could say that you know, the, 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 uh, just as you've got capitalism versus socialism, one of the key ideas in the play is the way that the, the inspector who represents the conscience defeats the businessman that represents the court and the law. Morality overcoming legal protection afforded to the rich. Your conscience over the, the police. The power of money is important and the way that money is the way in society that we give power to others and the way that the characters in the play use money to manipulate other people and to make themselves seem better but when you take away their money they've really got you know nothing likeable about them and nothing forgivable and finally the way that power is um, is used to help people take responsibility to show how people should take responsibility for their actions not avoid their responsibility and therefore leading us to catastrophes such as the world wars um, and if you can do that in an essay on power, you'll be doing pretty well. Good luck. But good heavens, man, I can't accept any responsibility. If we were all responsible for everything that happened to people that, that we'd had anything to do with, well, it, uh, it would be very awkward, wouldn't it? Oh, yes. Very awkward. <laughs>